Hello, good evening, and uh, welcome back to the second lecture in the PhD Mass Communication Research Methods course. Uh, in case you don't know, my name is Abdullah Obadamu, and I have three case, uh, courses, three lectures that I'm going to do with you. I've done the first one, which is about getting started, and now we're going to do the second one, which is about looking at the entire media industries and the way in which you approach research in media studies. I will be sending this video to YouTube so you can download it from there. You can share it with your friends if you want. And at the same time, I'm, I will also give you the, the lectures. So that is the PowerPoint slides, uh, which you can use. So that way you have the PowerPoint slides, you have the video on YouTube, and uh, I can also send you the Dropbox link where I will upload the video. So you have three sources of this particular lecture, the PowerPoint, Dropbox, YouTube. And that way you'll be able to, to get really, really well covered. So uh, let's 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 take a look at what we're going to do now, and uh, we, we will look at uh, this uh, lecture too. Now we are going to look at media, political, economy of cultural production in this lecture, and we will be looking at the the three spaces of media, cultural, economic research. Whatever you want to do, so long as it is in media studies, it is going to fall into one of these three groups. Remember, what we talked about in the last lecture was about the paces of research. There are four stages, you know, those stages, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. But in this, you are not talking about the domain of the research, except where you, you, you are going to focus attention on specifically what you are going to do. And that's why I call it media and political economy of cultural production. Now, in media and cultural studies, there is a several common approaches used for researching and documenting cultural production. Why are we talking about cultural production? Because whatever you do with media is a reflection of culture. It is actually cultural studies. Because culture and media converge together to produce communication. Whatever you produce, People have to use it. And people are cultural, and so they rely on culture to survive. So all production in media, from newspapers, from news report, are a reflection of culture. So it is very, very important to understand that we're dealing with the political economy of cultural production. Now, the first of these, although not exclusively in the domain of media political economy, the second is text and textuality while the third is sociological ethnographic approaches. Under political economy, cultural production is investigated and is investigated on the macro level as an industry. Newspaper is an industry. Film production is an industry. Music production is also an industry. Public relations, propaganda, advertising, they're all industries. So here, we are looking at the political economy of those industries. It is also assumed that the conditions of production shape cultural uh, production. The way you, 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 you produce an item and the way you distribute item and the way that item is consumed shape the way you produce content for that thing. When people don't buy your product, you're not gonna do it again. If you make a jingle and people don't buy it, they don't buy the product you are jingling about, then you have to change your jingle so that you can come up with something that is more acceptable to people. What I want you to do is reflect back on these various areas of media research. What advertising jungle appeals to you most and why? What advertisement attracts your attention and why? Do you not do the glow advertisement on uh, this uh, sports TV? Maybe you don't watch sports TV, but it's there on uh, CNN about a guy eating a massive plate of uh, amala or pandariam or whatever it is. Would that appeal to you? Maybe not, if you don't like uh, pounded yam. But for those who like pounded yam, it, it connects. So it is very, very important to understand that uh, the conditions of production, the way in which you produce something, shape the content of that thing. And there's such a therefore, in this case, attempt to link cultural outputs to the economic, industrial, and political factors that shape organizations and industries which then produce culture. This involves gathering quantitative data on those industries. Quantitative means one, two, three, counting, something that can be quantified. And this is done by asking the following questions. What are the costs of production? How much does it cost to make a film? 
How much does it cost to make an advertising copy? How much does it cost to produce a newspaper? And how much do we get out of that newspaper every day? So when you are asking all those questions, quantitatively, you are, you are carrying out a research in media political economy. What are the main revenue sources, advertising, sales, sponsorship of any particular product? How are the cost of production broken down? And which processes from research and development to distribution? How much do you, if you're going to make a film, for instance, how much do you allocate on research? How much do you allocate on the actual production itself? And how much do you allocate for distribution? And at the end of it all, how much money did you get? So if you invested about, let's say, 100 million Naira to do a particular project, do you get 150 million or 140 million? Or do you only get about 70 million? The difference between a successful film and a prop, you know, a film that, that does not make it is a prop. A film that covers the cost of production and doubles it is a super hit. And that means that they have done an excellent research, excellent development work, and most importantly, effective distribution. Example is Avatar. I don't know if you watch films, but Avatar is one of the most successful films. Uh, and then uh, this, uh, the Titanic, you know, the one that about a ship that sunk, that was also a huge uh, thing. Uh, and then F9, that is uh, Pass and Furious 9. So pardon me if I don't give you any example from uh, Nigerian film industry or African film industry, because figures about the amount of money they, they, they invest in the film and how much they, they make are not normally available, or if they're available, for, they are a little bit uh, suspicious. How many competing organizations are there in the market? And what is their audience share? I mean, you produce a blockbuster film, and you think this is very good. But other people are also producing their own blockbuster films, and they are thinking that their own films are also very good. So what you have is a, a, a competition. So that, that is very, very important, very critical for you to, to understand. Again, that is part of the uh, political economy. Now, such figures are collected, aggregated, and used to make inferences about the state of cultural industry involved and the possible impacts on the cultural text it then produces. In this way, researchers have looked at how advertising and other financial considerations are likely to have impacted on cultural production and distribution process. If your film is not successful, it means you have not advertised it effectively. Or you are very, very poor at, at getting people to, to come and watch your film and to understand what you're what you're doing. In each of these cases, cultural production is investigated indirectly. The focus is not on those individuals who produce culture, but on the structures, external factors, and high-level decision makers which come to influence and shape mass-produced culture. For instance, in Nigeria, when you produce a film, you have to take it to a census board. In Kano State, there is a Kano State censorship board, so you have to take it there. Uh, at the federal level, there is a National Film and Video Census Board in Abuja. So that means that these, these boards, uh, regulators, have an input into what you say, and they can control what you say, because they can ask you to tone down your film, to reduce uh, something. They won't ask you to add something, but they will ask you to reduce something. They're not interested in what you have not included. They're interested in what you have included, that in their own view, uh, will, will, will either be, uh, will have an implication for morality, for the society, uh, and, and so on. For instance, the Kano State Census Board, some time ago, about a month or two ago, we are in December now, all right, that would be about October, November, banned any filmmaker from making a film about kidnapping, because they say that if they, they make a film about kidnapping, they will be given templates uh, to other people to copy, which I think is ridiculous. The reason is because in Kano, here in Kano, uh, sometimes in August or September, uh, a boy was arrested by the police because he kidnapped, and that boy was just like 12 years old, 12, 13 years old. He was arrested by police because he kidnapped uh, a younger boy in his neighborhood and was demanding for ransom, sending text messages to the boy's parents, demanding for ransom. Where did he see that? This, there was no even film on, on this. So the, the, the question of political economy deals with control, the way in which uh, government processes and structures provide a control on what you do. That's why it's called political economy. Politics because politics is involved. Economy because economy is involved. So researchers usually gathers data by obtaining and analyzing documents from industry and all government. Now you can see why political economy research is a little bit tricky. You want to know how much an advertising firm makes in advertising revenue? And they're not gonna give you. 
you want to know how much a newspaper actually makes out of its production, like daily truck, they keep producing the, the print edition. How much do they make? They're not gonna give you that data. You want to know how much a musician makes. He, makes, he produces music, right, for public consumption, and you want to know how much he makes. Oh, he will tell you, I don't make a lot because of piracy, because of Bluetooth sharing, because of all sorts of things. But he will not tell you that he didn't make much because his song is horrible. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't taste good. It doesn't, doesn't sound good at all. So these are the, the issues of, of carrying out a research like this, trying to get data that is reliable data from either government or from uh, the, the, the producer themselves. And the data may be simple financial data sets, industry surveys, and reports, policy, and legislative documents, or historical archives. All these are fairly easy to get, uh, but again, you have to go and dig deep, and you have to read in between the lines. But data about the, 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 the impact of all this on, on culture is very, very difficult because it deals with sales, it deals with financial reports, and it, it, it deals with determining how much was invested and how much was, was, was made and whether it was worth it or not. And, and many of the practitioners are not willing to give you that particular data. And therefore, as I said, the challenge of the researcher is to locate and assess this data, which can then be collated, aggregated, course reference, and so on. Such data is then used to develop a more macro account or to contribute to theoretical debates on the aspect of cultural production in that particular domain, in that particular area. Just because you did a research on film doesn't mean that your data is applicable to music or newspaper production uh, or satellite TV uh, services. <clears throat> now, the next domain is text and textual analysis. So the first domain you want to do is you are going to do something on cultural production and the political economy of cultural production, the regulations that determine cultural production. Next, now we are digging down, they're coming deeper. It involves applying forms of textual analysis to a series of printed visual or audio text. As with political economy approaches, cultural production is investigated indirectly. Wider deductions about the production and also consumption processes and infer from assessment of what is produced. In analyzing text, researchers seek to highlight the common codes, terms, ideologies, discourses, and individuals that come to dominate cultural outputs. Let's take a novel. You want to read a novel, you want to analyze a novel, you want to find out what agenda does the novel have? So you, you are looking at the novel line by line, word by word, and then trying to determine its focus, its direction. Same thing with a newspaper. You want to compare a newspaper like Tribune and Daily Trust in terms of coverage of banditry. So you want to find out you know, by doing critical discourse analysis, which is a textual analysis, whether uh, which of the newspapers is more objective in, in developing, uh, uh, in, in, in reporting banditry and kidnapping stories. Or you can do like uh, Dr. Muhammad Nanja did, look at cartoons, editorial cartoons, and, and, and see the way in which the editorial cartoons were able to cover uh, basic fundamental key issues in particular areas, whether it is mandatory economy, restructuring of the economy, and so on and so forth. You have to go through all the cartoons, all the newspapers, and pull out the cartoons and categorize them and analyze them. So you are looking at text and analyzing that text in terms of uh, cultural production. You could also look at films and analyze films. Dr. Ashuri Inua did that. Uh, what he did was he, he looked at a house of films, I think about 10 of them, and in, in relation to Indian films, because those house of films were copied from Indian films one on one. So what he did was he looked at the house of films, he looked at the Indian films, and he looked at the differences and similarities between the two of them. Or you can do like Dr. Musa Labaran, uh, who studied graffiti. Now, that's very interesting. Because graffiti is not something that is written uh, in, in, in a book. It's uh, writing on the wall or toilet hall, toilet, corridors, uh, walls of beautiful houses. Well, you children write with either chalk or charcoal. And what he did was collect all those writings uh, across a vast area in northern Nigeria, categorized them, and came up with a beautiful way in which the public spaces, public walls are used as template for expressing dissension or political agreement or political disagreement. Or you can do like uh, uh, Dr. Hassan Yahoo did when he looked at texts that are written on trucks. You know, all these big lorries, well, they have some writing on them, some of them, or even drawings or paintings of uh, a lion or an eagle. Uh, or some hero fighting something else, or just simply a, a writing. 
like Kema Haka, the same to you, you know, no king is God or something like that. So what he did was he collected uh, hundreds of them and analyzed them. But more than that, as part of cultural production, he wanted to find out what motivates people to write those things. And it's, it's very, very fascinating. So if you want to really uh, do a text and textual analysis and you want a good example, Dr. Musa Labarang on graffiti, Hassan Yahu, Dr. Hassan Yahu on uh, truck, uh, right, uh, truck uh, description on, on lorries, uh, Dr. Musa Labarang on, uh, okay, sorry, <laughs> that's graffiti. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Danja on editorial cartoon. I'm the one who supervised all of these students. So what this means is that if you come to me with some kind of crazy topic, I can accommodate it, I can handle it. And I think at the end of the day, we make an important contribution to knowledge. So this is the question that you ask. What can be said about the individual species in the text? Who are the contributors of the text? How are the texts framed and presented? What are the terms and phrases used and what is their symbolic meaning? What are the assumptions embedded in the text? In each of the four examples that I gave you, these questions were addressed and they were, they were answered. Uh, for instance, uh, Dr. Hassan Yahoo's uh, research on truck writing, the writing on trucks, revealed that each of those statements on a truck were not random. None of them actually was random they were a reflection of the ethnographic experiences of the truck owner. And he, he talked to them to explain to him exactly what they did, why they did it, what they did. And for each truck writing you see, there's a story. For each painting you see, there's a story. And he collected all the stories together and created an absolutely beautiful narrative. Uh, he has converted his thesis into a book, which I think he sells. So if you really want to see an example of uh, this kind of research, go to him and uh, buy the book. Don't ask for free, because it costs him a lot of money to, uh, to, to, to publish the book. So the answers to such questions gathered from analysis are then used to build arguments about those who construct cultural production at wider social, cultural, and linguistic conditions. For instance, Dr. Musa Labran did his own on uh, graffiti. And we were shocked, absolutely shocked, at what some of this graffiti is saying. I mean, you, you, you are passing by the wall and you see somebody has scribbled something in charcoal or uh, um, chalk, chalk, you know, white chalk. I you don't really think about it. But when Dr. Musa Labaran presented it in a particular context, it suddenly made meaning and it made us stand up. So, oh, well, that's interesting. I mean, we didn't know about that. To such an extent that when he did his PhD examination, final external examination, one of the uh, examiners who happened to be a former minister of communication in the Republic of Sierra Leone, and also a former lecturer in this university, Bayer University, Kano, in the 1980s, about 1981, and who is an international scholar traveling all over the world. Uh, I think the last place he was was in Japan. He, he was so fascinated by Dr. Labran's finding that he asked Labran to contribute to a theory, to create a theory. And we're all like, wow, I mean, can you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, of course you can do that. I mean, you have done a research which nobody in this part of the country has done. And you have taken frameworks of uh, graffiti research from other places and applied them to here in, in Northern Nigeria. And therefore you can create a theory about graffiti use in Northern Nigeria, which nobody else has. And you can publish it and it becomes an international and best-selling uh, example of African ethnographic research. So don't be afraid to experiment. Text and research at, uh, at areas concerned vary considerably. Examples include looking at ideological goals and primary definers that dominate the news coverage. The one they cover news, do they say Pulani bandits or do they just simply say bandits? It depends on the part of the country that you are from. Probably if you are from the South, you say Pulani bandits. But then they discovered in Oyo or Ekiti or somewhere that those who are disguising themselves as Pulani bandits were not actually Pulani, but they are Yoruba. So you, you, these are the kind of things you do in text and textual analysis. Decoding the language and symbolisms of visual text in television and, and film, what kind of uh, symbolism is used? For instance, as I said in my last lecture, there is a term that has been created here in Kano called Suburbuda, which is dubbing of house language over Indian, uh, vo Indian voices. We remove the Indian voices in a film and then put house uh, voices. So 
do the words and expression used in the Hausa translation match the cultural context of the original Indian expression? Very, very important. We don't know. This is one area where somebody could do a research on. Making links to wider social and cultural values or deconstructing advertising texts and the means by which they are going to appeal to consumers. <laughs> Let's take an example of Globe. I don't think there is any telco company that spends more money on advertising than Globe. Uh, they talk about their data, they give you massive gigabytes of data, cheap. But then I look at my contacts and I discovered that I can only remember two people who have Globe. Everybody has either MTN, Airtel, or Nine Mobile. Now, if <coughs> Glow is so good, how come it is that nobody is really using them massively? Of course, you could say that people are using MTN because that's what they are used to, even though MTN is one of the first, Airtel was the first. But then MTN became a bit more stronger, more dominant, so people jumped on that. But you can still believe that people don't have at least Glow as a backup. They don't. So. Do those advertising advertisements really appeal to people? They don't appeal to me. I use Nine Mobile and nothing, absolutely nothing, is going to make me change from Nine Mobile because I've been using Nine Mobile for over ten years. Uh, it's, you discover that Nine Mobile is the least subscribed service in Nigeria, which is fine with me because the less people there are, the less the possibilities of choking it over or overloading it and therefore slowing down its services. So why? Are people not rushing for Glow uh, routers, despite the fact that Glow spends a huge amount of money on international advertising? You know how much it costs to advertise during uh, is it La Liga or La Liga football? I mean, it must support the millions. And yet, are they making their returns on investment? And do you see all those uh, video advertisements they do of whether uh, this lady is going to a uh, you know, some kind of function all dressed up in your Yoruba dresses and things like that. Or oh, is it because they tend to be too culturally specific in their advertisements? They are only speaking to one particular section of the country, Southern Nigeria. I don't see their advertisements that reflect much of the culture of the North. And they made that, that big mistake when they first came to Kano. They wrote on the billboard, San U Dazua, San U Dazua. They wanted to say Sanidazwa. Now, the thing is, if you can't speak the language, get somebody who can speak it. You don't believe that just because you pick it up in, in Agege or you pick it up in uh, uh, Lausa or you pick it up in Obalande, uh, then you can speak it. Get somebody who is a native speaker. The Emir of Kano, the late Emir of Kano, was annoyed and he, he made his uh, comments uh, known. And that is part of the reason why people say, oh, the Emir doesn't like Glow. <laughs> I don't like Glow. So very, very important when you're dealing your advertising test to see whether there is cultural specificity, cultural sensitivity, the way in which you appeal to, to, to people. That, that is what makes it work. So we can look at all these advertising companies and see which are culturally specific. And you can go to Alhambra, you can go to Lagos, or if you like Ibadan, you can come to Kano and then and, and, and see the advertisement, both the print advertisements, the, the video advertisements, the um, internet advertisement, the television advertisement, and then compare the cultural specificity of all these advertisements and see whether the audiences in the places where they, they, they were, were, were intended really, really do subscribe to those services. Now, since culture and language are contained in all forms of social interaction, so text for analysis can be found in a range of media forms and social settings. Music lyrics, clothing, political speeches, posters, popular magazines, and geographical layouts have all been recorded and analyzed uh, as, as, as text. Uh, even political posters, do you see how they, they put the president in a larger frame and then the vice president in a smaller frame, showing that the, showing that the president is bigger? Or the way here in Kano, here, here in Kano, and for those of you who are going to do your research, uh, probably from 2022, you may have some rich data in terms of political posters. Uh, let me give you an example. I, I wish I could have shown you the, the example, but the time is too short. <clears throat> Buhari is well known as a president, well liked, people loved him, uh, APC. But Abba Gira Gira, the, the one of the gubernatorial candidates for PDP, knew that 
people don't like Atiku in Kano, so they're not going to align to Atiku. So what we had was a poster produced by Abba Gira Gira's people that shows Buhari as the president and Abba Gira Gira of opposing party, PDP, as the governor of Fukano. So he, he's trying to use the political appeal of Buhari to pull people to vote for him, even though he belonged to a party different from that of Buhari. And this is the kind of analysis that, that tells us what happens when you're doing text and textual analysis. The last, and I think the final, is ethnographic or sociological approaches. This involves observing and documenting the actual processes of people, uh, people involved in cultural production. In some cases, work is on the quantitative, I mean, quantitative and macro level and relies on surveys of professionals and companies involved in cultural production. Many surveys of journalists, for example, have been conducted over the years. What do journalists think? What do they feel? How do they feel when they are asked to go and cover banditry and kidnapping cases? Or Boko Haram insurgency or the Niger Delta militants? Uh, I mean, your editor says, you go there and cover yourself. What do they feel? Are they scared? Are they happy? Are they saying, oh, no, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that. And the editor says, well, if you don't do that, you can leave the job. And they say, yeah, I can leave the job. I, mean, I can live without it. I don't care, but I'm not going to risk my life going over there. So that kind of individual uh, study of the culture of particular producers and journalists here, producers, is what sociological and ethnographic approaches look at. Sociology deals with their society and their relationship to their larger social forms. Ethnographic deals with their own individuality within a particular context. But however, the majority of sociological work in media and cultural studies has tended to be more qualitative in terms of meaning, in terms of interpretation of what they do, and carried out at a localized micro scale. For instance, uh, if you carry out uh, audiences of a particular product, uh, you can gather about 10 of them, those who like that particular product, and then you can carry out an FGD about that, their perception of that particular product. First of all, the product is a sociological item. So you're dealing with a sociological study. Secondly, the product and the people that you are dealing with are form an ethnographic group. So you are carrying out an ethnographic study. And it has usually involved a combination of interviewing and ethnography, most commonly in the form of limited participant observation. For instance, you want to find out the preferences of me, uh, PIMS for, of children. So you gather a whole bunch of children and watch them. You don't show them films, but you allow them to, to watch films or to argue among themselves which film they should watch. And you record all their observations, and then based on that, you come to your conclusion. In these cases, the researcher is seeking to discover the practices, cognitive processes, and social interactions of professionals involved in producing culture, like poster producers, people who produce posters. Dr. Noura Ibrahim spent a long time with poster producers here in Kano. He wants to find out what kind of posters do they produce? What motivates them to produce those posters? How do they distribute those posters? How do they get their audiences in those posters and how much money they make out of those posters? And for him to do that, he was actually with the, the, the poster producers in, in Kulimi Market, in Sabangali, in Gopalwambe Market. He stayed with them for, for months. He was doing an ethnographic study of, 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 of these poster producers. And to the best of my knowledge, he's the only one who actually spent time doing an ethnographic work because he, he's interested in seeing the, the production itself and uh, the process that shaped that production and that communicates the meaning of those posters to people. So how are decisions made about what posters to make? And those decisions are, are, are informed by the outside political forces. Like football, for instance, when Messi moves from one club to another, it becomes an event. And so posters are created to celebrate that event. When Ronaldo moved from one club to another, again, it becomes an event. And these things are created. When the Nigerian military record a, a large success, it becomes an event and the posters are created. So he had to stay with them and find out which decisions informed their use of fixtures, which they downloaded from the internet, by the way, or from magazines. They just simply cut them, paid them, and then produce a massive poster. Why did you do this? And uh, his PhD thesis is first class, absolutely wonderful piece of work. Oh yes, I survived him too. <laughs> I'm just blowing my own trumpet. I mean, all these guys are super, super, super fantastic because they did their examinations very well, even though their topics are not seen as mass communication because everybody was talking about newspapers, 
talking about the magazines and radio. No, 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 I said, no, no, no. We're dealing with mass communication in general. We're dealing with communication between individuals. We're dealing with text, sexuality. We're dealing with music. So, so long as it's something, that could, someone, it's something that is produced by someone and is communicated to another person, it is media. And we have the right to analyze it. We could, also ask, we could also ask, for example, how does an editor decide about whose stories, features, and programs are to be invested in, published, or broadcast? I mean, if he likes you, you are always on the front. And if he doesn't like you, he puts you at the back. So if he likes you, you are on the front page. If he doesn't like you, you are in the middle of the, page, of, the of the newspaper or at the back. Who are the new creative artists in film, music, and... Uh, and television that are worth supporting and promoting. Uh, and that depends on your own prejudices. And in this, you have to put away your prejudices and remember that you're a scientist. You are conducting a scientific research, a research that has wider implications, wider interests for humanity, not just dispelling your own ignorance or educating you only, but at the same time, educating others. So for instance, what will you do about, will you do a research on Rahma Sadao and all the controversies that Rahma Sadao has been creating? If you don't know Rahma Sadao, she's an actress in Kanewood, that is a house of film industry located in Kano. And the lady is always fond of uh, getting into controversies and so on. That only made her more and more popular. So you see here is a lady who is uh, sexy, glamorous, uh, like a model with international connections and uh, quite a lot of money. And she gets involved in all sorts of uh, controversies, and yet she is extremely popular among ordinary people. Why? Is it because she is seen as breaking a stereotype of what women should be or what they should do? It's very interesting to study it because she's more or less relatively new in the film industry. And despite the fact that she has done hundreds of films, what makes a cultural product or individual popular and or critical success? Uh, why is Alinu successful? Why is Rahama Sadao successful? Why are House of Fame successful among House of People, but not successful among the Yoruba? Because Yoruba don't understand House of Language. So even if the House of Language uh, films have subtitles in English, they don't communicate much because they deal with a mindset that is different from that of anybody else except the House of. But those films are very popular in Ghana, in Burkina Faso, in Togo, in Chad, in Niger, in Cameroon, and in Congo, and in Gabon. Do you know Hadiza Gabon? Well, she is from Gabon, actual Gabon. And she's one of the biggest house and movie industries. She's not even house, and couldn't speak the language. She has to learn it. And in Cameroon, there is Amal, who is a Fulani girl, who could not even speak a single word of house language when she came over. But now she's a superstar. So it's very, very important to, to analyze all these things in terms of uh, receptivity in terms of the audiences and so on. How do creative artists interact with producers and marketing people? <clears throat> if you want to produce a film or you want to uh, pr produce a uh, music, uh, what's the relationship between all the three? These, these are behind the scenes researches that nobody bothers to do because everybody wants to do something safe about newspaper, you want to do a critical discourse analysis and for your carrying an analysis, comparing uh, daily trust, a tribune and so on, or spin doctoring of a particular governor who is so bad that even his own spin doctors could not handle him, uh, but they have to, to find a way of saying, oh, yes, sir, your excellency, you are doing fantastic. They know he's not, but they don't know how to communicate to people that he's actually horrible. As a research method, the sociological approach to investigating cultural production is probably the most difficult and erratic. It can also be very rewarding because you are, you are there in a society, in a subgroup. You are trying to understand them. And for you to undertake this, you have to answer that question I asked you at the beginning of the first lecture. Why are you doing your PhD? What motivates you? Are you doing your PhD because you want to prove to people that you are also a doctor? PhD, Kagani, Niwako, Dr. Ani, that kind of thing you want. Are you doing your PhD to impress your wife, your husband, or wife or husband equivalent? Are you doing it in order to impress your boss? You know, your boss has only a third class in his undergraduate, and now you have a PhD, and you want to show him that we doctors don't behave like you guys do. It's an ego thing. 
Or are you doing your PhD because you are genuinely curious about an aspect of knowledge and you want to discover so that you can become enlightened and understand more about that aspect of knowledge and consequently communicate your understanding and your findings to the larger society. And by doing that, you are educating the larger society. Is that your motive? Then this particular area should not be too difficult for you because you are going there with a dedication and single mindset. This is because it relies, gain, it relies on gaining access to and cooperation of individuals who may be quite difficult to meet. Let's say you want to do something on uh, roadside fuel sellers, you know, in Kano, they call them Bumburutu. So how do you get into there? That means you have to have a gatekeeper. And that gatekeeper is the person who will allow you into the group, show you and explain to the group that you are okay. So that is very difficult because some people tend to be very scared of going into groups or into settings that they don't know. You want to do something, you want to know something about the communication habits of civil servants. Again, you require a gatekeeper who will introduce the civil servant. But when you get into the group, you find that at the beginning, they are a little bit kosher. They don't really open up. But that after a while, they begin to accept you. And they begin to even ignore you when you are not participant, you are not part of the participating process. But getting into the beginning, and they're getting in at the beginning, can be very, very difficult. So uh, that is why they say it is a little bit difficult and erratic. Because the moment you get in, they may stop the behaviors you want to measure. So you have to find another group and continue your research. It also demands detailed and time consuming work on the micro scale. That means you have to be with a group like Dr. Noor Ibrahim did. He was, he was with this poster producers day and night. Okay. Uh, he, he, he has his lectures. The moment he finishes his lectures, he had no time for himself because he was on field work. Off he goes to over one bay or to Samangari. And if you are really interested in this uh, particular aspect, we could ask Dr. Noor Ibrahim to come and share his experiences uh, on this. So I can ask him to do that until I have responses from some of you saying, oh, can Noor come and share with us his uh, perspective on sociological and ethnographic approaches? Then he can come and spend maybe like an hour or so uh, talking to people about what he did and uh, how he did it. And I think that will add and enrich the, 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 the lectures. Consequently, there is a high risk of being overtly subjective because once you get inside a particular group, you tend to sympathize with them and therefore you become subjective and, and representative because you cannot generalize this group because of your involvement in it because you are too subjective. As well as say little of consequence on a wider macro level. And the question is you cannot ask her the question of, so what? Okay, you have all the civil servants or TV viewers or satellite viewers or football viewers, and you are dealing with them on a micro level, trying to understand their codes, their speeches, their language, and everything. But you are part of it. I mean, if they are watching uh, Chelsea and Arsenal, you are a Chelsea fan. You you become you align yourself to the Chelsea people, and disalign yourself to the Arsenal people. So the idea is for you to go into the TV viewing center where they're watching football, regardless of which group, uh, which team you like, you don't care. All you're interested in, the audiences and how they interact with each other and how they communicate with each other. That's ethnographic approach. That is what makes it work. You are not involved. You are not reflected. You are not part of the process. All you are doing is just simply documenting what they are doing, and that's what research could be. However, it does look firsthand at cultural production in action. It makes fewer assumptions about individuals and social relations and is arguably more exploratory and more innovative. And a theory develops more organically as observations are amassed and collated as opposed to the situation where the researcher looks for financial or textual data to support a theory. That's political economy and text and textuality. In this, you are immersed in the audience. You are watching them, observing them, and understanding them. And the end of, at the end of your fieldwork, you have what they call hallelujah moment. You know, that moment that says, oh my God, I, I, I now realize what they are. So unless you, you can reach that level, you have not done any research. So that is why it is quite rewarding, but very exciting and very challenging. And like I said, only one person I know did this, this university, and that is uh, Dr. Noor Ibrahim, the head of the Department of Information and Media Studies. So if you're interested, we may talk to him or we may ask him to come over and talk to you, it all depends on the, the coordinator, Dr. Osman Bichi. So <clears throat> regarding cultural consumers, when you want to do a research on cultural consumers, remember we said 
uh, political economy of media production, that this was regulations and controls about what is going on, the infrastructure of media production. We talk about text and textuality in which you look at the individual texts and analyze them. Then we look at sociological approach in which you are part of an audience, let's say football viewers, uh, you know, you want to find out the codes uh, of communication among themselves and how they relate to the individual uh, football teams and uh, the narratives and that are made about scoring the ball or something like that. Now, finally, you're gonna look at consumers, all right? So somebody has to do something, somebody has debuted something, somebody has to consume something. So you can also forget about all those uh, stages of media, political economy, sex and sexuality, and uh, uh, ethnographic approaches and look at consumers of culture in order to analyze their understanding of cultural production. Consumption, therefore, in its many forms is not a new phenomenon. But since the end of the European Second World War, consumption in industrialized countries has proliferated to a certain extent that the first consumer society was coined. Arguably, cultural consumption has especially increased because of technological advances have led to the development and spread of new forms of media and information on communication technologies. These have in turn generated new forms of cultural texts and made cultural uh, content much more accessible. This is a poem. Oh yeah, that's my granddaughter on, on, on that. She's my wallpaper. Now this is a poem. This phone has radically altered consumption of media products. You don't buy newspapers anymore. You just simply use your phone to uh, browse through the net and read as many news as you can. You have RSS feeds or many newspapers that you can subscribe to and get all these newspapers summarized for you in a day, major headlines and so on. You can use your phone to watch TV. You can use your phone to watch NTA uh, uh, channel or whatever thing that you do. Even CNN, you know, you can use your phone for everything. So the merger of media production processes into a single technological determinism concept has created a new form of consumers. And it is very, very important to understand how these affect consumption. And if they affect the consumption, this will also affect production. Now, these in turn, therefore, have generated new forms of cultural text and made cultural communication more accessible. Facebook, anyone? I mean, imagine if there is no Facebook. You don't have to imagine it. Some time ago, Facebook was shut down. WhatsApp or WhatsApp was shut down. <clears throat> Well, I think some couple of hours or something like that, and the whole world shook. This is because, not because you have sensitive data in Facebook and WhatsApp, but because you are like on another planet. You cannot communicate with other human beings. You are scared, you are worried. Maybe the world has come to an end. Maybe everybody has left the planet and they have run away. And here you are on a planet isolated. There is nobody, you are scared, you are worried because you are part of a group. And just one thing, Facebook, WhatsApp, just one and you are shaken, your life is shaken. So it is very, very important for us to understand how technology and the merger of all these media platforms affect us as consumers. So the term cultural consumer refers to those who consume cultural text or engage in cultural practices involving consumption, which is bloody obvious. The aspects of consumption are purchasing something and or using it up, but consumption cannot be reduced to these two activities because it includes a variety of other practices such as listening, thinking, and traveling. Many people travel to stadiums in order to watch football. So what's the point? I mean, the football is shown on TV. You can watch it on your, on your phone. If you have a DSTV subscription, I mean, if you really care about football and you want to watch it, subscribe to DSTV. And then you can watch it on your, on your phone. You don't have to go to the, uh, the stadium, you have to find a place to park your car, you are worried about parking your car, you are worried about people stealing your phones, and you have to go and sit down in the, in, in the, in the, in the stadium with all these smelly people, people smelling, shouting, and, and so on. They're trying to steal your phone. And you, your mind is so much on your own personal security, they're not really focusing attention on, on the game. So why bother? But yet, people tell me, that they have to go to the stadium because that's where the fun is, sharing happiness and joys and sadness with other people like-minded. That it's not fun when you're doing it alone. Well, I still can understand it. There's clearly a wide range of cultural products and practices for culture of cultural consumption. This is just an example. People have to spend a lot of money buying a LED TV, a lot of money paying for DSTV subscription so that they can watch their favorite football games but still preferring to go to the stadium to watch the actual games. 
what the point? Cultural consumption <clears throat> entails production in the sense that consumers have to make sense of products and they are producers of meaning. So they produce meaning. What makes meaning to you doesn't make meaning to another person, but it's consumption. For instance, I don't really like football. I don't care about football. You know what I like about football at all? The way people are running up and down all over the place. Is that running that really fascinates me? Not, not scoring, not anything. <laughs> because like I said, I don't know anything about it. It means nothing to me. But it means a lot to other people to certain extent that in some cases, arguments break out in viewing centers violently and people are often killed over interpretation of a particular player's abil ability and skills. I just don't understand it. So we produce, the, the, the products produce meanings for us in different ways. Uh, same thing with music, for instance. There's rap. Man, I like rap. I like it very much. So there's rap music. And people say, oh my God, this is a horrible music. I don't like it. What do you like? Oh, I like uh, Davido. I like uh, Wizkid. I like d -Bunch. I like all these guys. But I don't like hip hop. I don't like rap. I like Allah. I don't like Shata. I like this. I like that. In other words, each consumer makes his own sense of cultural production. And what you want to do in you know, certain consumers is to find out what informed their choice of that, that particular product. And what should I explain this? Users and gratif gratification theory that says I engage in this because I like it. It means something to me. It gives me an emotional lift. It, it makes me happy. And that's why I like it and I'll continue liking it. I'm going to buy every single album this guy makes because I like him. Oh, and there's no way I can listen to that music. It was absolutely horrible. Different strokes or different folks, but they are consumers and they are the audiences of your research. The analysis of culture encompasses the study and the process of production, consumption, and circulation, as well as the product and the practices involved. This is what we do when we are doing cultural studies as well as media. But media audiences and cultural consumer, of course, not the same thing, but the terms are often used interchangeably because of the extensive overlap. You can't produce something without somebody consuming it. So when you produce something that is a target, you are producing it for a particular group of people, or for a particular group of consumers. So they are actually overlapping. Much of the culture we consume today is mediated. That means it'll go through a particular medium. And cultural consumers, like media audiences, produce meanings and engage in a range of activities. They do more than just use up the products. Research into cultural consumers requires both researchers and cultural consumers to be familiar with relevant cultural texts, experiences, and practices of both production, distribution, consumption, and the value and the meaning that, 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 that they make out of all these uh, processes. In, 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 in the United States, by 1940s, media effects, uh, media effects research has arguably generated a particular kind of focused interview in which research participants need to have been involved in a particular situation or practice, such as having watched a particular television program about who they can subsequently be interviewed. This context makes it impossible to locate origin of any media impact in particular items. A second problem concerns the terminology of audiences, consumers, messages, and effects, which implies a one-way model of communication which takes active producers and uh, of messages and consumers are passive recipients. Again, you're gonna do this in uh, theories of mass communication, the hypodermic needle theory, media ethics theory, and so on, but I'm not the one to change that. Somebody else will be handling that. Texts and consumers, as well as their interrelationships, are more complex. Texts both reflect and generate certain representations. They create and reproduce culture. For instance, women may consume self-help literature because they experience problems. But at the same time, this kind of literature convinces them that they do have issues which need solving. Moreover, books are part of a wider trend towards a therapy culture, where therapeutic advice is increasingly offered and used in a commodity-like fashion. You know, how to reduce your weight, how to use diets to reduce weight. I, I'm a little bit heavy and I want to reduce my, 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 my weight because it has health consequences. But what do they say? Exercise. You are not doing an exercise, so you have to keep running up and down. So I decided to walk around my block. That's when I was living in another place. I said, okay, every morning I'll put on my uh, track suit and the canvas shoes and walk around a block. It took me about 45 minutes to do that. 
I can't do that in Canada because you are trying to work around your block. You may come across all these kids who snatch phones. Of course, you can come out without your phone, but if something happens to you, there is no way you can tell people that this is what has happened to you. So I just stopped. So I decided to use a bike. And then I discovered that despite the fact that I spent an hour or so every day on a bike, I'm still not, not reducing my weight. And all those books keep telling me all that. So you know what I did in the end? I changed my diet. Clean living, clean diet. That's it. No amala, which I hate anyway. I don't ever eat it. No yam, no uh, semovita, <coughs> no rice. If I have to eat rice, it is going to be a uh, basmati rice. So self-help therapy books help me eventually. With what I eat, a lot of salads and a lot of vitamin C. I reduce the weight by about five to six kilograms, and, and I'm a little bit happy. I still need to do more, uh, but we use text as, as part of therapy, and it will be very interesting to discover how many people really believe in those books that they read, uh, and how many people uh, do the thing that the books ask them to do, and what is the outcome and the consequences of doing all that. In this context, therefore, self-help literature clearly rep uh, reproduces and creates cultural values and consumption of what you do, not just the literature itself, but also the food you, you eat. Cultural consumers are diverse groups of people whose diversity is brought to bear on cultural texts and the process of meaning making. The dynamics between cultural texts and consumers can be better conceptualized through discourses. This, the concept of discourse, which refers to a series of sanctioned statements that are circulated around an issue and used to make sense of it, allow the researcher of a broader research of a broader and therefore a more adequate question than the effects of consuming uh, media messages. You want to find out the coverage of banditry in northern Nigeria between leadership and vanguard. It is far much more useful to do a critical discourse analysis of the words that are used to, to, to cover to write the reports over like maybe six months or so than to say what is the effect on readers of banditry from the report that have been written. So in other words, you, you, you look at the two processes involved. One, you only look at what the reporters write over six months. And two, you, you, you are saying, I want to find out whether people who read these reports by tribune or uh, leadership have any impact, they, they, they feel any impact of the reports that are written. There's no way you can, you can measure that effectively, but you can measure a critical discourse analysis of the words that are used by the two newspapers to examine whether they are shaping agenda in the narrative of banditry. Another thing is you could, for example, ask through what uh, kinds of discourses consumers understand topics such as insurgency, which is what I gave you, and in what ways these understandings are linked to media discourses. Discourses are constantly reproduced across different sites in our culture. In this cycle of reproduction, it is hardly it is hard to identify points of origin or relations of cause and effect, which pose problems for media consumption research in terms of directionality. Where did it come from? Nobody knows because we cut it right in the middle. That's what we cut it right in the middle. We don't know the beginning, we don't know the end, but we're in the middle. So we don't know the trajectory. And that's very, very important for us to know because. It could be fake news, it could be misinformation, it could be disinformation, it could be post-truth, it could be any one of these things, but we need to know where it started. It becomes very difficult to specify, <clears throat> uh, to specify the media in the origin or inventors of discourses. You can only suggest that as institutions of mass communication, the media acquire a powerful position in the meaning-making process. Agenda, shaping, agenda setting, they set the agenda. Cultural studies as a whole has become increasingly interested in cultural consumers, and it often uses a qualitative method to study processes such as attitude formation uh, or, meaning, uh, or meaning attribution. Now, this ends uh, my, my, my lecture. So what, what we did was we looked at the three, or if you like, actually four stages of cultural food action, political economy, textual textuality, sociological approaches, and consumer society. And what we're saying is that everything that you want to research on is based on one of these three domains. This is different, though, from those categories of communication research that you're going to do, because these three things 
apply to whatever category of research you're going to do. They are there in health communication, they are there in intercultural communication, uh, they are there in all the other forms of communication that we discussed in the first lecture. But so this, this, while those are the, the broad text, the broad area, the broad, if you like, the estate where you're going to do this research, this lecture is about the houses in the estate because it tells you what each individual focus is going to be. Whether you're going to look at regulations by the government for cultural protection, whether you're going to look at the way texts are produced and the language they are produced and the way they are, they are transmitted, whether you're going to look at the microgroups, people who form themselves and communicate a particular behavior that you are trying to map out to understand, or whether you're looking at the consumption, the people who consume and why they consume. And the reason they consume is, of course, related to, uh, to, to the political economy, it's related to the kind of checks it is, and it's also related to whether it is part of a particular restricted social group. For instance, if a film is banned, someone says this film is banned because of this, because of that, that's when you discover that people want to watch it. They will be looking for it desperately. So that is a uh, cultural production or uh, the, 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 the political economy of cultural production in this case has an influence on consumer production uh, and the way the consumers perceive it. And of course, people want to know why is this film banned? It is, or why is this book banned? And in analysis of the book or the film to find out why it is banned, uh, you discover that you are doing textual analysis. Who reads these books? And you are doing an audience, and you are doing a sociological and ethnographic study. And who buys these books? You are dealing now with consumer research. So it is very, very important to see these things as integrated. It's not that they are cut and separate, but they reflect one on the other. But that does not mean that you cannot have a dominant point of view. I mean, if you are doing text and textual analysis, you are not really interested in the larger form of production. But you can, of course, point to the political economy of the process if there is political economy. For instance, Dr. Hassan Yao's study on truck literature deals with text and textuality, but it doesn't deal with the political economy of the production because he wasn't really worried about whether there is a government regulation. This is my car. I have the right to write whatever I want to write on it, so long as it's not offensive. But you see, the issue of so long as it is not offensive, now we are dealing with public sensibilities, and therefore we are dealing with political economy. Because the moment he writes, uh, the truck writer writes, uh, the truck uh, owner or driver writes something on the vehicle that abuses other people or religions or something like that, he is now cutting into the domain of regulation. And even though it is not a mass-produced uh, activity, the fact that it's in the public sphere, whenever he drives, wherever he drives, people will see it and read it. It means that someone will have a, a, a say on what he is doing because he can cause public uh, distension, public uh, riots, and, and, and things like that. So it is very, very important for us to understand more and more and more of this. Uh, I'm not sure whether I should give you what I should give you. I, well, I will give you something, but I'm not sure what I will give you uh, by way of uh, trying to understand some of these uh, processes. But I think I can look around for a file or so and uh, send it to you to the WhatsApp group. Now I'm part of it. I'll leave the group, of course, after I finish my lectures. But I will go in the group so that I can share the lectures. But at the same time, before I leave, I will be able to share the files with you so that you can, you can do more, all right? So thank you very much for being patient. I hope you're watching this from either your laptop or from your phone. If you want, you can share it with your friends if you like, if you think it is useful enough. Either way, thank you very much for being here. Bye-bye, and have a very, very wonderful day.